All right, welcome everybody. Today we're going to be playing Witcher 3 now. Sorry, we're doing heaps today. So uh, heaps are a new kind of data structure um, that is like a binary tree, but uh, but uh, a little bit different. So let's get going. First of all, we're going to review the data structures we know already. Uh, we've got um, three data structures that are pretty close to each other, a linked list, a vector, and a deck. Are sort of mm, similar, right? They they keep track of data the way that you insert them. So if you insert uh, Bob, then Sydney, then Steve, a linked list, a vector, a deck will have Bob, then Sydney, then Steve in that order. Okay. So uh, all of them preserve the order of insertion, and all of them are going to have big O, you know, pretty similar big O times for most operations. The the places where they're different are on the screen here. So vectors get order one inserts at the end. Uh, decks get order one insert at both the front and the back. And linked lists get order one at the front, the back. And if you have a pointer somewhere in the middle, add the middle too. Um, and you're like, well, it sounds like linked lists are the most useful. And in some languages, they just provide you lists as sort of like the basic data structure. The trouble with that is uh, this concept called cache locality. And this is why I'm talking about it today because heaps are actually pretty good at this. Um, when you grab a number from RAM, that's actually a really slow operation. It's even worse if you talk about the hard drive. The hard drive is like off in like Canada, right? And you've got to like put it on a plane and ship it over. You can do a lot of work in between asking for an integer from the hard drive and when you actually get it, like a lot. Uh, RAM, we think of RAM as being fast, and, and in fact, it's much faster than the hard drive. So we tend to take everything in the hard drive and like put it into RAM so it's fast. It's still not that fast. So something like 100 editions you can do, give or take, depends on your exact specs. But just as an order of magnitude, let's say that you could do 100 editions in the amount of time it takes you to load one, one address. So minimizing the number of... Um, Pointer dereferences is actually oftentimes a lot more important than anything else when it's talking about real world performance. Now, a linked list of vector and a deck are going to have the same big O time. If you do something like uh, adding up all the numbers in a vector of integers, adding up all the numbers in a linked list of integers, adding up all the numbers in a deck of integers, they're going to have pretty, pretty much, you know, like you're not doing any inserts in the middle or deletes from the middle or any of that. So they're going to have just the same big O time. But you will see that in practice, when you benchmark these things, vectors are the fastest by quite a bit, like noticeably, noticeably faster. And then decks are second fastest, and then linked lists are slow. And the reason for that is because a linked list has a pointer to another linked list, and that has a pointer to another linked list, and that has a pointer to another linked list, and those memory dereferences actually kill the performance in practice, even though the big O time's the same. So how a CPU gets around this latency of pulling data is when it grabs data, it grabs an entire what we call a cache line of data. And so oftentimes you might get um, maybe you know 16 integers all at once. So you load one integer and then you get his 15 closest friends. And so if you're iterating through a vector, by the time you're getting to the second element, you've already gotten it because it's already in cache. And so because vectors are all contiguous in memory, this works really nicely with the architecture of modern computers. And this is also why it's really important that you guys take CSI 45, CSI 45 computer architecture. Even if you don't work as a computer architect, you have to understand how things work under the hood in terms of like RAM and caching and uh, pipelining and all these other things you learn in 45. But for now, at the CSI 41 level, just understand that when things are contiguous in memory, they're faster. That's kind of uh, that's kind of one of the learning points for today. Things that are contiguous in memory are faster. A binary tree suffers the same problem that a linked list has, right? Because it's pointer, 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 pointer. Every time you knew something, it could just be in a completely different part of RAM. It doesn't have to be. And if you're lucky, all the all the things in your linked list get get allocated right next to each other. If you're lucky, but there's no guarantee of that. And you can just get a node here and a node here and a node here in RAM, and so you get cache misses left and right. Does that make sense to you guys? 
the, even though the, the, the theoretical speed's the same, in practice, you've got much faster performance for a vector. And that's why I say, if you don't need push front, don't use a deck. Use a vector. If all you need is push back, use a vector. Now, what if you only need push front? What do you do if you, like I was actually writing a program yesterday and I realized all I need is to be able to insert and delete off the beginning. What should I do? Which data structure should I use? I have to insert and delete off the beginning. Like I've got a line of people waiting at the bank and uh, people somehow get added to the front and deleted from the front of the line. Which one should I use here of these three? What do you guys think? Discord. What do you think? A deck, a linked list. What else? See the votes, people. Somebody say vector and we'll have all three. At least one person's going to be right. <laughs> probably between a deck. Yeah, probably with linked list. Or we're getting the votes in. Linked list, deck. Exactly split 50-50. Um, a deck, by the way, is basically a linked list of arrays, if you want to think of it that way. So decks are kind of like in this halfway point between a vector and a linked list. If you don't need to insert in the middle, you want to use a deck. So here, if we're only inserting off the beginning and deleting off the beginning, a deck is better than a linked list. But you know what's even better than a deck? A vector. <laughs> but wait, Kearney, I thought you said that vectors can't delete and begin, delete and end, delete and... I can't even talk now. Can't push and pop off the front. And, the, and you're, you're right, but what I did was I just called the front the back. I just made a new function called uh, push push front and pop front that just did it on the, the other end. <laughs> I just I basically just relabeled the, the end of the vector, the front, and so I just pushed and popped off the front, but it was the end, right? So I just turned, turned the vector around, I put my thing down, flipped it, and reversed it, right? So it, it worked fine. Like, it's just... You know, conceptually, we're like, oh, well, you can't insert at the front. So let's just look at it from the other direction. It worked fine. And uh, and then I got the speed of a vector without needing to use a deck. Deck is when you're inserting and deleting off both sides. If you're only doing one side, a vector is actually fine. You can just turn it around and reverse everything. Left is right. Up is down. Good is bad. I'm eating my potatoes with all the lumps. I don't know. So these data structures here, they uh, don't preserve the order that things were inserted. If you insert 10, 20, 30, if you insert uh, Steve, Sidney, Charles, whatever, they don't remember the order they originally came in. Okay, they have their own system, right? So for sets, also maps, also known as binary search trees, all the same thing, basically. Um, it always alphabetizes, right? It always sorts left to right, uh, unless you provide your own custom sort function. And so uh, these things are good at sorting, basically. If, if, you, if, you have the sort of, uh, if you have a sort of algorithm where you like insert something into your vector and then you sort it, and you insert something into your vector and you sort it, you insert something in your vector and you sort it, one thing I might tell you is just wait until all the inserts are done, then sort it, you'll save yourself a lot of time. Uh, so that's one option. But if you actually need it always sorted, then the set, the binary search tree, the map is the correct data structure for you because it's always sorted. So you don't have to spend any time at all sorting. Um, that's the main use for it. Also, um, just keeping track of like, uh, I don't know, like, yeah, that's that's basically it. You know, when, when you just have a rule that everything always has to be sorted, that's, that's when they're optimal. Um, these guys are not great at sort. Linked lists are annoying to sort. Um, vector sorts in in log n time. A set sorts in order of zero time, like they're already sorted. Now, an unordered set, also known as a hash table, is uh, order one insert, order one search, order one delete. They're the fastest. So the two data structures that I use in like 90 something percent of all my cases are hash tables and vectors my chocolate and vanilla ice cream. Those are the two that I use. Everything else is kind of like a specialty need, right? 
It's not like I don't use decks. It's not like I don't use linked lists. They just don't come up that often because it's not often that I need to insert and delete off of two sites, right? It's not often that I need everything always sorted immediately. You know, like is, is I mean, it, it'll happen. I'm not saying it's 100 percent that I use just vectors and hash tables, but those are like 99 percent of my maybe not 99, somewhere in the 90 percent. Everything I do, vector hash table, like those are my just go to data structures. They're so good. So. There are, however, other operations we could talk about that um, aren't insert, search, and delete. Because that's all we've really been doing this whole semester is like, how fast is it at inserting something into it? How fast is searching it? How fast is deleting? Those are the three kind of like big operations we do in data structures. But there's other operations. What other kinds of things could we do? Let's hear it on, on Discord. I'll pause, I'll pause the recording so everybody can get a chance. What kinds of things might we want to get from a data structure that isn't just purely insert, inserting an integer, searching an integer, deleting. Like, there's a lot more we can do with it. Like, you can get a master's degree in, in specifically in data structures. There's a lot of them out there. So I'll, I'll pause the recording now, and you guys can tell me what kinds of operations aren't on that list. Right, got some good answers on on uh, Discord. Uh, merging things, yeah, merging is a big thing. Um, if you want to zipper merge things where like you have everything sorted and you want to put them together also in sorted, um, it's stood colon colon merge, which is a name that I hate. Uh, if you have a sorted vector and a sorted vector, you can merge them together in sorted form in order in time. Uh, sets are obviously very good at that because they're already sorted. So you just iterate across them and merge them really easily. Uh, vectors, you have to sort them first to do a, a set merge kind of thing like that. So you have to remove duplicates. Um, Linked lists are great at merging. You just hook the pointers up and then you don't even have to copy everybody from one to another. You just, you know, connect them like Lego blocks. So there's, yeah, definitely things like that. Accumulate, adding everything together inside of a data structure. You could probably create your own custom data structure. Like if, you, if you're just always like wanting the subtotal, you can actually make a little custom data structure where it's just a vector. And every, every time you push back, you add to a running total. Every time you pop back, you subtract from the running total, and then at any time you just ask, okay, like, hey, what's the sum of all the vectors? And instead of doing an order n operation, you can do an order one operation and just return the current sum if that's the kind of thing that you do a lot. You have to always ask, like, what is the, what is the operation we're most commonly doing? What's the painful, like, where are we spinning our CPU cycles in this, in this assignment or in this, you know, project you're working on at your work? And, and you have to match the right data structure to it. That's the thesis statement of this entire class is in the real world, you're gonna be given problems and you have to look at the problem and be like, all right, what do we actually have to do here, right? Like if you're doing Dijkstra's, which is shortest paths, you're constantly querying a list of all of the cities, you know, in America and finding the one that is the nearest to the cities that you've connected to your network of roads that hasn't been connected yet. So you're, con you're constantly finding the smallest, um, the smallest value in all of the cities in America. You pull that off, you add that to your set of cities you've processed, you do it again. So you're constantly pulling the smallest value out of a set. And so that's something that a heap is good for, which is the topic for today. Uh, duplication, uh, average value. Yeah, same thing, you can probably cache the average value. Um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff you do, uh, including on this slide. Uh, how do we hold map data? How do we know? Uh, how do we know how far apart cities are from each other? Right. If you wanna if you wanna have uh, like a road network, right? You can't just drive from like San Diego to like um, Billings, Montana, right? You you drive from San Diego to let's say L.A. L.A. to Vegas, right? And so how do you represent that? How do you hold the the road network of America, let's say, you know, and then and then ultimately you want to know like okay how far by driving you know I'm gonna take the five or the fifteen you know ultimately you want to know how far it is to get to Billings how do you hold that what data structure would you use for that and uh, you know if you type anything on on chat in the previous class they suggested a hash map it would probably require like a hash map of hash maps or something like that so. Uh, every row is one of the cities, like San Diego, 
And then in that row, you have another hash map. And so you can look up like Billings and see that it's, I don't know, 1,500 miles. I don't know how, much, how far it is. All right, I picked Billings maps. How far is it from San Diego to Billings? Twenty hours. Yeah, that's that's a bit of a drive. And so, actually, what Google did right here is the result of a data structure, right? They've got every address in America, right? In, a, in some sort of database or data structure or something. And uh, 1,500 miles this way, 1,298, so 1,300. Somewhere between 1,300 and 1,500 miles to get from San Diego to Billings. It's not too, not too far off, I guess. A 20 hour drive. <laughs> I used to drive uh, San Diego to uh, somewhere around St. Louis. That's a 27 hour drive if you don't stop. Um, this is a Hell of a drive, let me tell you. It's a hell of a drive. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, back when I was in college, I was poor. Now that I have money, I fly. It's much nicer. Let me tell you. So, um, how do you find out? How do you find out the weather? Okay. Ever thought about this? So you pull up your cell phone. And you're like, "What's the weather?" Or if you uh, have Windows. On like the, uh, by default on Windows, it'll show the weather. Have you guys seen this before? There's a little icon. It's got the uh, sunny or partly cloudy or whatever. It's got the temperature on it. How do you get, how do you get the weather? It's kind of weird, isn't it? Like, because there's no weather station on my roof here. So how does it find the nearest weather station from where I am? Like, let's say I can, I can hand you my GPS coordinates, like my latitude, my longitude. I hand this to you. You're Mr. Weather.com or Mrs. Weather.com, and you want to give me the temperature, humidity forecast for the nearest weather station. How do you do that? I'm giving you an XY location. I'm giving you two numbers. How do you find the closest point to that without just going through every single weather station in the world, doing a Pythagorean theorem, right? Even worse, you know, because the Earth, the Earth's a, a sphere, kind of, right? Sorry, flat earthers. So the the actual, you know, computation is actually much more complicated when you take into account the spherical nature of the Earth. Um, have a few stations associated with the general area you're in. How do you how do you do that though? Like how do you how do you store that? How do you find? You know what I mean? Sorts nearby based on your current location, but you got an X and a Y. So if you sort everything by X, which is longitude, let's say, then everything's sorted by longitude and you've lost your sorting by vertical. So you'll find stations in, you know, South America, right? It's, it's interesting. It's an interesting question. And so, um, it's, uh, that's what I said, like data structures is like a fun topic. Um, there's this notion of a Roni diagram. And so if you look at this, um, yeah, here, imagine that this is the nearest uh, weather station, okay? And so if I click here, let's say, if I'm here, like my cell phone is here, the nearest weather station to me is here. And so you can hold the entire earth if you want uh, in terms of these polygons. You can pre-compute this because the weather stations don't move unless there's like a hurricane or something, right? They're, they're usually static. They usually don't move. And so you can pre-compute all this stuff. And so, so this is something called the Voroni diagram, which says for every pixel, you know, on the screen, color it with the nearest weather station to me. And so if you click inside of the polygon there, then it's going to return this one here. You're in Fresno right now. Whereas here, this is Clovis, right, or whatever. And if you want to be a little bit more fancy, then what you can do is you can do interpolation between different weather stations. And so, like, if you're if you're here, you're sort of equidistant from all three of these, then you could do uh, a sort of uh, it's not linear interpolation, 
it's a, a, a more complicated interpolation to interpolate the values between the three the three weather stations and get and get a more accurate because like if this one's like 50 degrees and this one's 60 degrees and you're halfway in between you know the, the weather might be like you're 55 right now give or take you know so uh it's fascinating stuff how do you how do you make this how do you create a veroni diagram it's a computational geometry class you know here's here's veroni for the earth all right and so that's like maybe capitals of provinces i don't know not sure what that is, what each seed point is. It's pretty cool. Um, and so, um, instructing it's not not that bad. It's not that expensive. And then once it's computed, you can look up. You can look up the weather. Like these are tons of these are very common tasks, right? Like it's extremely common to you know check the weather. Your your computer is probably doing it many times per day. Right, your cell phone is probably grabbing the weather. It depends how you have it set up all the time, and so it has to find this information very quickly. You can't do an order in. Am I nearest to Chicago? Am I near New York? Am I nearest to you know Toronto? Am I nearest to Paris? You can't do that. You can't do an order in search. You can do a very fast like login search, probably if not faster. You guys understand? Kind of cool stuff. Uh, image data. Uh, how you compress image data, like that's a whole junior level class you guys can take also. Um, I did something called wavelet compression. And uh, uh, I worked on a wireless video conferencing system for the military. And uh, the neat thing about wavelets is that um, it does edges like a lot better than JPEG. JPEG has, uh, JPEG does something called discrete cosine transform. It needs more JPEG. So have you ever have you ever seen this meme? It needs more JPEG. Let's find an image somewhere. Let's go to the memes channel. Yeah, that's fine. So we'll save this. Actually, we just probably just use the URL here. Okay, so we submit that, and then it it runs it through horrible JPEG compression. Yeah. So uh, JPEG uses what's called discrete cosine transform, which it, it looks at a grid of pixels and it tries to match the, the changes in color and luminance and all that stuff with a cosine wave and actually adds multiple cosine waves together to try and as accurately represent this block of colors as possible. And as you lower the quality on the JPEG, it starts losing those extra cosines because each one of those consumes space on your uh, on disk. And so when you lower the quality of JPEG a lot, you got like you, you got this. Let's zoom in on this uh, here. And so you got like a discontinuity, right? You got white to black. High 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 intensity luminance is zero. And a sine wave or a cosine can't can't do a discontinuity like that. It's very bad at edges. And so JPEG will go high and then it'll go low and then you get a ringing effect as the cosine comes back up on the other side. And that's why you see these halos around sharp edges in JPEG is because there's actually a cosine wave that kind of goes, it has to go really high to try and catch that change in luminance. And then it goes low and then it'll come back up high again because it's a, it's a, it's a cosine. It's, it's bounded, but you still get these ringing effects within a few pixels of a sharp edge and it looks terrible. And so um, wavelets do it much better because what wavelets do is they they start off with an image. I think this is Castleberg or something like that. Castleberg, Castleberg, Berg Castle. No, maybe not. And Berg. Does that look right? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. You want to recognize the castle? No, that's not. No. No. Dang. Oh, whatever. Anyway. 
So we started with a we started with a picture of this castle, and uh, it took up the entire space. And then then they ran the wavelet transform on it. So the way the wavelet transform works is the upper left corner becomes a down sampled version of the image. So it's like a thumbnail. The upper right part here is formed by running down each row of the image and subtracting the brightness of each pixel from the one before it. And so if each pixel is the same brightness, you get a zero, 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 black, 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 black. But when you have a discontinuity, like if we zoom in, we zoom in over here, um, you see that it's about the same, about the same, about the same, about the same, about the same. Then, there, then there's the edge of the tower, and it goes from black to white, the huge jump in luminance. And so that shows up here as a white line here. And then when it drops down again, that also shows as the other end of the line. And then you see it's black, 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 because it's mostly white going across here. And then there's another kind of shadowed line right here that you see show up here. And then, uh, and then when it crosses over the right-hand side, you see another line here. There's like the staircase pattern of the, of the building here. You see all of the vertical slashes are being picked up because as we go across left to right, there's a discontinuity and the, there's a big change in the brightness. And so that results in a white pixel here. The bottom left corner here is the same thing, but going top to bottom. So you can see we see all the horizontal lines here. Okay. You see all the horizontal lines on that stair step pattern. Here we see the vertical lines. And the reason why wavelet compression does this is because the human eye is very... Um, perceptive to errors in straight lines. And so like the letters in JPEG look terrible. Uh, behind me, behind me, you can see the straight lines of the door. If those lines were compressed poorly, you would see like ringing echoes of the of the door. Let's see if I can move my hands in mirror, mirror image. There. So, no, there. Eh, eh, no, here, no, eh, eh, there. Okay, so these lines here, These lines here would be mirrored and, and ringing and echoing, and it would look terrible. The human eye is very sensitive to edges like that. Um, and so wavelets preserve the edges really well. And then if all of the, if all of the color here uh, in the door behind me were to be compressed very heavily, we wouldn't really notice it because it's just kind of white, you know? And so like if we lose, like if some of the shadows like up here lose a lot of data, like we probably wouldn't be able to tell, you know? And so we could actually compress the the area inside of the the line very very highly, as long as we keep the lines because that's what what we see. JPEG is much better at doing like uh, flowers and like nature stuff, clouds, because in nature um, they don't have a lot of sharp lines, right? Like maybe if there's a a, a crevice in a rock or something that splits, you'll get a line. But um, you know, if you look at a sheep or something, like it doesn't have like a discontinuity like that. But a lot of human-made stuff does, including text on images, which is why wavelet compression looks better to the human eye. And then uh, the remainder bottom right part here is basically the difference between the thumbnail part and the edge part. And this is kind of like the remainder. And so after you do the, after you do the uh, transform where the upper left is the thumbnail, that's the edges left to right. This is the edges up and down. That's the remainder. You can construct it by doing the inverse uh, wavelet transform and reconstruct the original image. But typically, we don't. Typically, what we'll do is we'll throw away this, this, and this because we recursively repeat this. We can actually do this again over and over again until you might end up with a thumb, uh, thumbnail on the bottom, tiny little top left corner of the screen, very, very low res thumbnail. And so you can repeat the wavelet transform over and over again, however many times you want. And you can throw away these guys here that will give you, that'll throw away 75% of your image. With this, 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 and this, you can actually reconstruct the image quite well at four to one compression ratio. And if you wanted to, you can do this again and throw away these three and throw away another 75% of the 75%. And you lose, you, you lose image quality, but it doesn't look that bad as it degrades. So wavelet, wavelet transforms are nice for that. So that is an example of a data structure for image data. And so that would allow you to preview the image, like because the top left corner is a, is the thumbnail. Mm -hmm. So you could show that at, on a web page. Have you guys ever seen this on a web page? Like uh, when when it has a placeholder that's like fuzzy, and then it becomes crisper. 
like more detail comes in over time. It's a lot more useful than like watching an image load like this. <laughs> Normally when an image loads, it loads like that and it's kind of annoying. Progressive JPEG will load low quality, medium quality, higher quality, highest quality. And you can kind of see, all right, kind of see what's going on, right? And so Wavelet, Wavelet transforms can do that as well. As you send the top left corner first, and that gives you a thumbnail. And then you send the, uh, the edge data, and that allows you to reconstruct a good part of the image. And then you repeat, and you can order all the data from the top left to the bottom right and it will get progressively cleaner and clearer as you transfer more of the data over time. Or you can stop and just leave it as a lossy compression system. Yeah, sharper lines actually make a really big difference on thumbnails. So JPEG 2000 uses Wavelet transforms, uh, but JPEG and uh, HEIC, I believe, use uh, discrete cosine transform. I think HEIC, which is Apple's uh, image format, also uses uh, discrete sine transform. Um, So, let's talk about heaps now. Now that, we've, now that we've kind of set up, there's more to life than just insert, search, and delete. We can talk about heaps. And we've also talked a little bit about uh, contiguous memory being faster, which heaps are good at. Okay. So, binary trees can find the maximum element in a, in a binary tree in order log in time, right? To find the biggest element in the tree, go to the right, go to the right, go to the right, go to the right, go to the right. Whatever, whenever you hit rock bottom, that's the biggest element in the tree. Similarly, minimum element, go to the left, go to the left, go to the left, go to the left, go to the left. Log in steps later. There you go. There's the smallest element. Okay. Vectors, you just iterate across the whole thing looking for the smallest element. Linked lists, decks, hash tables, you just got to go through them all. Hey, are you the biggest? Are you the biggest? Are you the biggest? Are you the biggest? Order in, not great. Heaps are optimized to do minimum or maximum. Pick one. You don't get both. You'd have to have two heaps, I guess, to do both. Um, heaps are heaps are designed to optimize minimum or maximum operations. What's the biggest element in the set? What's the smallest element in the set? That's what they're good at. And there's a lot of uses for that. Okay. So uh Remember how we talked about heap allocation and stack allocation? Stack allocation, you know, is a stack. You push onto the stack, the next stack frame, you push onto the stack, the next stack frame, stack grows down. When you return from function, stack grows back up. It's an upside down stack. It's a descending stack, we call it. Heaps used to be implemented using the heap data structure. I don't think they are anymore. So there's a heap. Um, so Luke, you understand the code now? You get what's happening here in C++? Now that it's been illustrated properly for you. I think I think we just stop here, honestly. Looks like sand. It's a heap. It's a heap of sand. Yeah. I think I think I think it's clear. You, you guys can go and, and construct the uh, the heap now, right? Mm -hmm. Good. So a heap is a binary tree, but it's not a binary search tree. That's why I, I, I have to catch myself sometimes because I'll just say binary tree sometimes when I mean binary search tree. Uh, a heap is a binary tree. Every, every node in a heap contains two smaller heaps, a left heap and a right heap, just like a binary search tree. But the, the, the class invariant, what we call the heap invariant, is a little bit different. So for a binary search tree, the rule is everybody to my left is smaller, everybody to my right is bigger. With a heap, if you have a max heap, let's just say max heaps. I don't know. Why not? Instead of, because there's also min heap that's the same, just in reverse, and I don't want to keep repeating myself. So for max heap, the heap invariant is everybody above me is bigger. Everybody below me is smaller than me. So wherever I am in the heap, all of my parents are bigger. All of my children are smaller. Okay. So it's like a binary search tree rotated 90 degrees. So instead of left being smaller and right being bigger, up is bigger, down is smaller. Okay. And what this, what this does is it means if you go up and up and up and up and up to the very top, 
that's the max. Root is the max. And so you can find who the maximum person is in one operation. So if you're constantly asking your data structure, who's the biggest person? Who's the biggest person? Who's the biggest person? This is your data structure. This is something that comes up all the time. Uh, for example, if you're making a video game, it's very common in a video game for uh, being, you listening, Lamar? Uh, it's very common in a video game for things to happen in the future. So your code today creates future actions, okay? You remember how we talked about uh, lambdas and things like that or in function objects, say you can like store a, you like store a, a function object and things. Let's pull this up here. So you can make a little, Function f is equal to you guys remember this? You can make a you can make a little make a little thing. So this is gonna print out hello world three times. So I can say the function, I can save a function into a variable of type function. Okay. And so then I can call that function, but I can also put it into a data structure. So I can say in three seconds, run that function, which is pretty cool. Think about how grenades work Bean. right? In a video game, you pull the pin and you throw the grenade and then nothing happens immediately, right? So you have to write code that says in three seconds, make that thing blow up. So if you don't have a heap, what you have to do is you've just got a vector of every object in your world, iterate through it every time and see if it's got something to do. So every frame, like maybe 60 frames a second, 120 frames a second, you're going through all million objects in your world saying like, are you going to explode? No. Are you going to explode? No. Are you going to explode? No. And then, oh, I found a grenade. Oh, well, what time is it? 10. When's it going to explode? 13. Okay, don't explode yet. You know, in every frame, you're running through every object. It's extremely inefficient. It's extremely inefficient. Because what you really want to do is put it into a heap. A min heap in this case. Sorted by when is, like, let's just say it's a, just a heap of grenades, like all the grenades in the world. Every time you throw a grenade, it gets added to the grenade heap. It's not a literal heap, like a pile of grenades, but the data structure for heaps. And so you've got somebody that's good, like it's currently time 10 seconds and you throw a grenade and it's gonna blow up at time 13 seconds. And then somebody throws a long last, a long duration grenade and it's gonna blow up at time 20. And then somebody throws one that's gonna blow up at 30 and 40 and 15, 16, 17, and 70. And so you've got like a thousand grenades in the grenade heap, but the next one to blow up is time 13. Current time's 10. So you go one frame, you go one 120th of a second later. Are any of the grenades gonna blow up? Let's find out. We grab the top element of the heap. Hey, are you ready to blow up? I'm gonna blow up on time 13. Well, the current time is 10.01, so no. And then you're done. You don't have to look at the other thousand people in the heap because that's the next guy to blow up. Whoever's on the top of the heap is the next one to blow. And so if he's not gonna blow up, none of them are. And so you're done. I don't have to check any of them. And then the next frame, it's now time 10.002. Are you ready to blow up? Nope, done. Time, time is now 10.003. Are you ready to blow up? Nope, all right, done. And so you can have an order one check. Are you ready to blow up? Are you ready to blow up? And you can just, because most frames, no grenades exploding, right? What if you have two that blow up at the same time, then you blow it up and then you recheck. Uh, you blow it up and then you say, hey, is there anything left on the current frame? And you handle them. You have a little while loop, while, while top, uh, while heap dot top dot time is less than or equal to the current time, something like that, right? Then you just pull, you pull everybody off the heap. But the, the, the thing that you optimize is the reality of the situation is that most frames in a game, there's no grenades exploded, right? Even if you've got a thousand grenades in the world, there's 120 frames a second and grenades explode you know, every couple seconds. So you've, you're, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of frames where just nothing happens. 
then one blows up. Order login, delete, done. And then you go back to business, okay? So heaps have uh, insert, login, delete, login, search, no search. You cannot search a heap. You, like if you want to ask, like, hey, is, are there any uh, are there any flame grenades in the in the grenade heap? Yeah, you can't really, you can't really do that. I guess you could like pull everything out of the heap and order in operation, see if there's any flame grenades. No, okay, and then stick them all back in. Just extremely inefficient. You could do that. It's an order in operation. I guess you could do it. You could search it in order in time. That's doable, I guess. But we don't really search heaps. Like if you want to ask, like, hey, does Bob have any grenades in the grenade heap? We nah, we usually don't do that. Yeah, it's it's very expensive. Because you have to pull everything out of the heap to search it and then put everything back in, you know. Or, you know, if you have access to the underlying data structure, a heap is actually held in a vector and you just have to scan through the whole thing ordering. It's not a binary search tree. It's not good at searching. It's not fast at searching. It's not designed for searching. It's designed to say, like, who's the next guy to explode? That's it. Because you do that over and over and over again, way more than anything else. Okay. So, uh, da -da -da -da. yeah, every little, every level of the data structure is greater than the nodes below. That's the heap invariant. Okay. But the kids below you, the kids below you could be in any order. So you don't know if the left kid or the right kid is bigger, right? So if I, if I were to ask you, this is a max heap, so the biggest element is on top. That doesn't mean the smallest element is on the bottom. Like you would, you would think that A, which is the smallest element here, would be down here. Mm -mm. A is over here. I mean, it's a leaf. It's on the bottom somewhere, but you know, it's not the furthest level down. You don't know. With a heap, you just don't know. There's no real, like E, you know, E is like, you know, and there's H and G, you know, like it's like sorted left, like the, it's just, there's no guarantee beyond the fact that everybody below you is smaller than you. That's, that's the only guarantee you really have. Left and right kid, you don't really know. Okay. So here's how it works. So the uh, the heap gets uh, a new person inserted at the next available spot. Now, one of the really cool things about a heap is that it is full and compact and complete. Uh, so that means there are no gaps anywhere in a heap. It's a binary tree that is guaranteed to be balanced, guaranteed balanced, guaranteed complete. There's no holes anywhere in it. The, the only, the only spot, spots that are open in a level are the ones beyond where you've inserted yet. And so the tree is just very nicely always balanced. You fill out each level before moving on to the next one. You fill in the next one. It's very, very nice. And, and because it works this way, you can actually hold a heap in a vector. And so you don't need pointers. Did you guys hear that? It's a binary tree that doesn't have pointers. You don't use pointers in a heap because it's in a vector. And so you can use the index of your vector to find out who your parent is and who your kids are. So you don't have to hold a parent pointer. You don't have to hold the child pointer to the left, child pointer to the right. Saves a lot of RAM. Like a binary tree, like if you have a binary tree of integers, you'll have two 64-bit pointers to hold one 32-bit payload. It's extremely inefficient, right? That's 20% uh, efficiency. 80% of your RAM is going to overhead when you have a binary tree like that. So there's no pointers. Just like... I'll, I'll show you how to figure out the math in a second, but let's let's go over how to insert. So if you insert a heap, uh, the, it always goes into the next available spot. And then you check to see if the heap invariant has been violated. So is it true that H is bigger than uh, S? What's bigger? S or H? Let's put it up. Which, which letter is bigger? We got H here. We got S here. S is coming in, coming in strong right here. Okay. Yeah, S is bigger. So we have violated the heap property, right? So what we do is we just swap, we call it std swap, and we just swap the value of h and the value of s. That's it. And then we, then we repeat. So who's bigger, p or s? p or s, who's bigger? If you guys are counting on your fingers the alphabet song, it's okay, I did it too. s, yeah, s is bigger too, so we swap them again. So. That guy becomes an S, this guy becomes a P, right? And then we're gonna compare T and S. Who's bigger, T or S? Yeah, T. So we're good. The heap property has now been, uh, the invariant has been satisfied. 
So T is bigger than S, S is bigger than P, P is bigger than H, S is bigger than N, N is bigger than E. Yeah, we're good. So it takes a login, right? In order to, uh, in order to insert, you have to go order log base two of N, the two doesn't really matter, up, right? There's log base two levels. If you have eight elements, there's roughly three levels. So at most you have to do three insert, three swaps going up, well, bubbling up. And then if you delete, the good news about heaps is that deleting is actually about as easy as it gets out of any data structure. So what you do, the trick to deleting on a heap is you swap the root and the last person. Because when you delete, you always delete off the root. The root is the only place where you delete. You always get the biggest element every time. So what we do is we just swap the T and the H, and then we call vector.pop back, and the H goes away. Or the, the T, sorry, the artist formerly known as H. So now we've got an H up here. See how easy that is? You swap the T and the H, you pop the pop the last person off the, the vector. Now you've got an H in root. So uh, we need, now we violated the heat property again, right? We got somebody smaller. And so this the only tricky part is that you have to look at both the left kid and the right kid. Between S and R, which one's bigger? Which one's bigger, S or R? S, yes, very good. So what we do is in order to preserve the heap proper key, we swap the S and the H, and then we do it again. Who's bigger, P, N, or H? P is correct. So again, we swap the P and the H. What's bigger, G or H? H. So are we good? Ever, have we look, look at look at the whole tree over here, right? Have we preserved our heap invariant now? Is it true that every person is bigger than both of its kids? S is bigger than P and R. P Q R S, right? Yep. P is bigger than N and H, and now P. Yeah, good. N is bigger than E and I. H is bigger than G. S is bigger than R. R is bigger than O and A. We're good. You guys see this? We have a valid heap again. So to delete, you swap the root and the last element, make the last element go away with a pop back, and then the guy bubbles down. And that is login steps. So, oops. Going down is also order log in. So inserting is login, deleting is login, searching, we don't really do it. It's order in if you really want to, we don't really do it. And getting the max element is order one. Okay, so max is the name of one of my favorite dogs ever is order one because you just return the value in root. You guys see that? That makes sense. That's the whole data structure. That's our lecture for today, basically. I'm going to show you guys how to do this in C++, but that's that's it. That's it for for heaps other than the array representation. That makes sense. Not too bad. Can you delete something that isn't currently in the root? Nope. <laughs> push always goes to the next available spot. So if we pushed again after this H here, uh, if we inserted Z or something, the Z would go here. If you push again, it's insert B, goes here. So the, the, the push is always going at the end and then they bubble up, like the Z is gonna bubble all the way up to the top here because it's the biggest element. Um, and then popping always pops the root. You don't ever delete anywhere else in the, in the heap. If you're deleting elsewhere in the heap, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Heaps are designed to pop off the root. That's it. You always get the biggest element off. Yep. Good question, Kevin. Um, so the array representation. So heaps, like I said, are cool because you don't need any pointers. You don't need a pointer to the parent. You don't need a pointer to the kids. You can just put it into a, a, an array. And so the, indi the indices of the uh, array, we, we usually draw heaps still as a tree because it's easier to conceptualize. But in reality, heaps are basically always held like this. They're just held in an array or a vector. And so the root of the tree is index zero. The left child of root is index one, 
index two. You guys see I'm just going like I'm reading a book. Three, four, five, six, index seven, index eight, index nine, index 10. Ten. See that index ten is the one. Make sense to you guys? It's left to right. Next time you insert something, it's going to come in here, um, and then that will be at index eleven. And you just do that with a pushback, right? You do a pushback with the new data, and then you bubble it up if it violates the heap invariant. That's it. It's easy to write. When you delete, you swap the last. You swap the last element with the first element. So if you were to pop, the 11 becomes a zero, the zero becomes an 11, and then you do a pop back, vector pop back. Goes away, and then now that you've got a zero up here, you gotta fix that. And so the zero and the 10 would swap, so this becomes a 10, becomes a zero. The zero and the nine would swap, this becomes a nine, this becomes a zero. The eight and the zero would swap, and now everything's, everything's fine. So how do you know who your kid is? How do you know who your parent is? If you don't have any pointers, well, look at the look at the indices and see if you can figure out the see if you can figure out the uh, algebra on this. There is a algebraic pattern that is very predictable and routine and not too, not too complicated. So one multiply, one add. See if you can figure out the algebraic relationship of each node to the nodes of its parent. It's left kid and it's right kid. It's three similar but slightly different algebraic expressions. I'll go ahead and pause it now and give you guys a second to, to think about this. All right, so uh, let's take a look at, uh, I don't know, this, this fellow over here. So the left child of three, this is index three, right? This is uh, zero, one, two, three. Index three is the nine, right? It's the nine. The left child of the three, is going to be found in index two times n, n is the index that we're currently in, plus one. So right index three, our child's in index seven. Two times three is six, plus one is seven. The right child is in index two times n, plus two. So three times two is six, plus two, index eight is where our right child is. Our parent is in the reverse of this, which is a little bit tricky to, to figure it out. So uh, you take your current index, you subtract one, and then you divide by two. You don't have to subtract by one or two. You don't have to know if you're the left child or the right child. Mm. You, you figure that out if your index is if your index is odd, you're the left child. If your index is even, you're the right child. But um, you don't have to do that because this will actually handle both cases. So uh, seven minus one is six, divided by two is three. Three minus one is two, divided by two is one. So seven divided by, uh, six divided by two is three, three minus one is two, two divided by two is one, one minus one is zero, divided by two is zero. That's how you get your parent. No pointers, just all on an array. And to come to the point, this is all contiguous in memory, which is nice. So you have a nice contiguous, uh, Block of, block of memory. Now when you, add, you when you run through it, you're probably not going to be run, running through it, sweeping left to right like you do in the vector. But it is nice, and for smaller heaps, you'll get a lot of uh, cache hits. For bigger heaps, you're probably still going to cache miss uh, a ton. Okay, so let's, let's show you how to do this in C++. Okay. So, C++. What data structure is set? What data structure is unordered set? And why is heap found in Q? <clears throat> Which one is this? Which one is this? And we might need to hashtag include a vector as well. Just so the whole gang is here. All right. Uh, would it be ignoring the remainder? No, it's integer division. So if you have a three minus, uh, so if you, if you have three and you divide by two, you get one. Right, so that, that takes advantage of integer division dropping the decimal, right? 
Uh, set as VST. Yep, long line. There you go. Set as VST. Unordered set is a. Actually. All right, and then the heap class is found in Q of all things. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a second. So let me show you something cool. Uh, let's do a vector, a vector of integers named vec is equal to. Um, 90, 10, negative 30, 780, 420, 100. Okay. So how do you make a heap? Heaps are our max heaps by default. If you guys want to find out how to do a min heap, uh, ask me in a little bit. It's annoying. Like uh, the C++ standards committee made some decisions that were not very good when it came to heaps, um, but it, you'll, you'll see what I mean in a bit. So, but just to make a regular max heap, not too bad. Priority Q of integers named heap. That's it. So that's a heap. What options are on a heap? There's push, there's pop, size, Top, empty, that's it, very, very simple. Uh, it's called a priority queue because you can think of the higher numbers as having higher priority. Kind of like if you have a line in, at the club, and I, I know a lot of you guys are too young to be going to the club, but uh, at the club, you know, if a VIP rolls in, they cut to the front of the line. So with a heap, you can think of it, if you have a max heap, the highest number always goes to the top, so if somebody comes in with a higher priority than anyone else, it cuts to the front of the line and is the first one to be, to be pulled into the club. Okay, So that's why it's called a priority queue. They're often used for priority queues, like a queue, but people with the highest uh, priority get put to the front. Now, back in the day, I used to give Kanye as an example of somebody with a higher priority, but given all the uh, anti-Semitic stuff these days, Kanye probably has the lowest priority to get into a queue now. I don't know. Okay. So... Uh, let's do, yeah, heap.push is how you add something to a heap. Heap.top gives you the top element of the heap. Heap.pop deletes. That's it. Top, pop, and push. That's what you need. Push inserts, top searches, it gives you the top element. And pop, push, sorry. Push inserts, top searches, pop deletes. All right, so let's put everybody from the vector into the heap. For every integer x in the vector, heap dot push. So that's going to put every element from the vector into the heap. You guys understand? Makes sense. You guys got that? BSD hash map. Then what we're going to do is we are going to say while heap dot size. So while we've got elements left in the heap, let's see out the top of the heap. And then we will delete the top of the heap. So we are adding all of the data into the heap and then we're deleting all of the data out of the heap. We have a vector, we're shoving all the data in the vector into the heap, and then we're pulling it all back out and emptying it. Seems pointless, right? But check it out, it's sorted. So this is a sorting algorithm called heap sort. Heap sort is literally the easiest um, sorting algorithm to write if you have a heap already, right? If you already have a heap, how do you do heap sort? You stuff a bunch of numbers in there and pull them out. And they come out, you get the biggest, you get the next biggest, you get the next biggest, you get the next biggest. There you go. It's like the world's easiest write sorting algorithm. Like in CSI 40, oftentimes we give students like write selection sort, write bubble sort. And it's actually kind of complicated. Like you got a doubly nested for loop, you got to go through the whole vector and find the biggest element and pull that out. And then somehow mark that guy as being deleted and then go through it again and pull the second one out. And that can't go into the first slot. It's got to go into the second slot now. It's actually kind of complicated, especially for 40 students to write. Whereas with heap sort, which is a order in login algorithm, it's maximally efficient. It's maximally optimal. 
What do you do? I insert in elements and then I delete in elements. That's it. Every insertion is login. Every deletion is login. Can't be unbalanced. You know, you don't have to worry about unbalanced heaps. They, they can't be unbalanced. It's just a very easy algorithm to write. And it is provably optimal. This is, if I put this into a, uh, if I put this into a function called void uh, heap sort, call it heapy, heapy sorty, why not? Vector of integers named that we can make it into a make it into a function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push everything from the vector into the heap. Then I'm going to delete everything in the vector, and then instead of printing it to the screen. I'm going to say vector dot push back to the top. Yeah, there we go. So we take everybody in the vector, stuff it into the heap, clear the vector, and then pull everybody back out of the heap into the vector. Give me a thumbs up if you understand this algorithm. So everybody in the vector goes into the heap, erase the vector, and then everybody in the heap goes back into the vector. But they're sorted this time. So this is a provably optimal order in login sort, which is the fastest you can theoretically do uh, on random data. All right. So if we come down here and we run heapy sorty, heapy sorty on the vector, furniture x in vec. That's it. It's as fast as it gets, at least in terms of big O. Um, there's an obvious question here, which is how do we have it sort least to greatest instead of greatest to least? Anyone wanna anyone wanna ask that question on, on Discord? I hate I hate this question, by the way. So just now. No, you need you need to ask. Somebody needs to ask it. Do we need a minimum heap? Well, if you want to sort from there is no minimum, there is no minimum heap, by the way. There's only priority key. Awesome, thank you, Jared. So, yeah, how do we do sorting from least to greatest? Well, as it turns out, uh, do you guys remember how the sort function takes like vector.begin, vector.end, and then it takes like a comparator? So you can pass in a third function here, a third parameter that's a function that compares two elements of the type of the vector to see which one's bigger. And if you just switch the, the alligator so it faces the wrong way, then it'll sort big as the smallest or small. Yeah, there's the same kind of idea here, except it's, it's actually a template parameter. And so what we would want is a comparator function to be able to put in here. The trouble is the standards committee in their wisdom put in a, put the parameters not in the correct order. So the second parameter for the heap class, the priority queue class, is actually which data structure do you use underneath the hood? And that, of course, is std vector. And then now I can pass in my comparator function. As it turns out, there is, and it needs to be vector of vector of managers. Um, as it turns out, there's actually a function that will return if one element is less than another. And that's called and that's called less like that. So watch what happens though if I if I do this. It's gonna return if one element, one int is less than another. Oh, it's still sorted greatest to smallest. That's because less is actually more. It uses the less function of seeing who's less than another person to sort them greatest to smallest. So the less function sorts the heap greatest first. And if you pass in, if you pass in greater here, it, it sorts it least to, to greatest. Uh, and, and that's how you do it. So it's, it's terrible. It's actually really, really bad. Um, you could reverse the vector, you could, but 
it's better not to waste an order in operation if you don't have to. So you can just choose for the priority queue to be a min heap. So this is how you do a min heap. And if you want to get rid of the STDs, because I know my students don't like STDs. Other students do. I don't know. I don't get it. People in other colleges are trained to love STDs, I guess. But not here. Not here. We don't like STDs. So this is how you make a min, min heap. The min heap, uh, the, the only annoying thing, there's two annoying things about it. One is you have to give the vector type, which is basically always a vector type. Um, here as the underlying, you know, data structure, those should have been swapped in my opinion. So the comparator should have been the second parameter so that you could just neglect the third parameter, but you, but you can't skip a second parameter if you're giving a third, you have to give it. So that's annoying. And the other annoyance is that you pass in greater to make it sort least to greatest and you pass in less which is the default to make it sort of greatest to least, which is just backwards from logic. But why would they do that? I don't know. <laughs> why do they choose max heap instead of min heap? I don't know. Somebody made decisions. You know, like it, it kind of makes sense. Like whoever has the highest priority comes to the front. Like that makes sense, I guess. But in computer science, a lot of times you want to do something like Dijkstra's algorithm where you have all the cities in America and they have a road network and you've processed some of the cities and you've got a list of people that are like connected to the cities that you've currently processed and you need to find the minimum of that set. That's a min heap. And so you pull that off, you add it to your set of process cities, you add all of its children to the frontier and then you repeat. And so you're constantly doing min heap, uh, adding the children of the current guy that we're processing, popping them off and repeating until the min heap goes empty. So min heaps come up a lot. I don't know. Or they could have made two different classes, a max heap and a min heap, but yeah, I, I'm not going to defend it. I'm sorry. I, I think it's dumb myself. So yeah. I mean, I get it, but like, it's dumb. The, this part, especially like I've never once not wanted to use a vector on the back end for it. So, okay. So, uh, yeah, so that's heap sort. This is called heap sort. Yep. Uh, heap sort is like, heap sort's like the world's easiest write sorting algorithm. Just put it in, take it out, it's heap sorted. Uh, another not one for the standards committee. I know, man, I know. I don't know, like, sometimes, just, I don't know, okay. So let's do, let's do, let's do the grenade thing. Let's do the grenade thing. So you guys want to see this? You guys want to see like the ability to like pull the pin on a bunch of grenades, then over time have them explode, something like that. I think that'd be fun. We got like got a little bit of time. We should be able to do it. Uh, you know, I'm just going to leave heap sort here so you guys can look at it. Put it down here. You guys can look at that later. Um, okay. So okay. we're gonna make a struct. It should be a class, but I'm not. Because we don't have that much time. So we're gonna make a struct called future we're gonna call it grenade. Grenado grenade granada. I got no ideas. So it's going to be a grenade, and it's going to have two things. It's going to have an integer for time, which will default to zero. And it will have a function. I don't think I can do this. Yeah. Uh, right, stuff with arguments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Void. Does that work? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. And then we'll need like a uh cool operator. Actually, this. Hmm. I don't know if this is gonna work. Okay, I'm gonna try that. Auto operator, starship operator.
I'll just go here. Okay. Pool operator less than const grenade percent g const. Uh, so basically, one grenade is going to be less than another when its time is less. So we're going to return my time is less than g time, and that makes one grid. We're going to be sorting the we're going to be sorting the grenades based on time, right? We want the the next grenade to explode to be the top of the heap. So, um, grenade name, name uh, so when this function gets called we can have bob Sydney and Alejandro okay. right now uh, the Probably put a new line in there. Huh? Always test your code. Sure does it. Okay, so grenade named Bob blows up. Grenade named Sydney blows up. Grenade named Alejandro blows up. That colon looks a little weird. Let's just take that. Okay. So there we go. But they blow up immediately. We don't want them to blow up immediately, right? We want them to blow up at some future point, right? And so let's do this. So we're gonna have a priority queue. Let's steal from down here. And we're gonna do a priority queue of Granados, grenades, and keep. And let's see if it likes it. We got a lesson operator, so okay, we're good. Lesson operator is very useful, very useful stuff. Allows you to put it into a binary search tree. Let's put it into a heap. Um okay. So Instead of just calling these things, what we're going to do is we're going to make, uh, we're going to say heap.push. That takes a grenade. So we're going to put in, time. how do we want to do this? How do we want to get the time? Properly, improperly, let's do it improperly. Okay. Okay, so the current time, current time is equal to, uh, let's not use time, let's say integer now is equal to okay. 64 bit, fine. Uh, okay, no, no. okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna push into the heap the grenade named Bob, and Bob is gonna detonate at what time? Bob will detonate at now plus three million. Okay, so Bob is, is All oh, right, because this doesn't, it's not a. It's, Uh, let me look at some. Okay, so rather than getting into how functional works, uh, I just pulled out the uh, parameter here. Um, so basically, we're going to have a grenade go off. Uh, we're going to have a grenade go off in three seconds, and six seconds, and nine seconds. So we put these into the priority queue, and then uh, 
let us uh, just pull the values out. So let's just see if they're sorting properly. We want this to be a min heap, not a max heap, and it's probably going to be backwards actually. So let's we'll say for auto const auto reference reference x for every 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 well nah, can't do that. Okay. while heap dot size like that uh, see out uh, heap dot top. That's going to give us the top grenade dot time. We will also print out the current time and then we'll do heap dot top. So what we're doing is we are printing out the current time. So it's been uh, uh, 1,933 ticks. A tick is a millionth of a second. It's a microsecond. And so we're going to have one grenade go off in nine seconds, one go off in six, one go off in three. You can see it's a max heap by default. So the less than operator causes it to sort greatest to smallest as expected. So we just need to make our less than operator do greater than. If we do this, you'll see the next grenade is the three second one, then the six second one, then the nine second one. So now all we got to do to have a fully functioning, you know, grenade future blow up, you know, system is uh, we will just say, We will say while true if heap if heap dot empty break. So once we once we're out of grenades, we're done. In reality, we would want to have some system to add things into it. Right now, I'm just queuing up all the all the grenades at the beginning. In practice, we'll be able to like put new grenades into the queue as well. Uh, but basically, yeah, we're gonna have our main loop here. This is like our main, main gameplay loop. It's doing stuff. Uh, in general, if the heap's empty, we just move on and do other things with our, with our life. But for now, if, if we run out of grenades to blow up, we're gonna just quit the program. Yep. So if the heap's empty, we're done. Okay. Otherwise, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say uh, auto uh, now is equal to clock. Do that second time. Now it's equal to clock, and then we can say if uh, while heap dot top dot time. If the if it's ready to blow up, then we will call heap dot top dot f. Boom. So we've saved a function into the data structure. And now we're calling the function on the top, the, the top grenade. The grenade's ready to blow up. Its timer has expired. We, we have it go boom. In a video game, we'll have it do radial damage around its location. It'll have a location and a bunch of other information. It'll have all that information. Uh, here, we just have it, you know, just print. It blows up. Okay. Um, uh, but what's cool about this is that you, can, you don't have to use the same function every time. You can have a different function for flame grenades and Merv grenades and pipe bombs and things like that. You don't have to have just a boring grenade blows up, you know, radial damage thing. You can have different functions. You can, so when when their time comes up, it'll call whatever function you gave it. It's pretty cool. And then we say heap dot pop. And that's it. That's uh, that's our whole thing. So basically, as long as if there's a tie, like that was a question earlier, if you got two people that are blowing up at the same time, it'll blow all of them up, right? and then move on with life. Um, we probably don't want to just immediately go back up to the top. We could probably do a use sleep or something. So we'll sleep for like a tenth of a second. That way we don't hammer the, the server's gonna be sitting there, are you ready, are you ready, are you ready? So we'll just, just go to sleep. It doesn't have to be, we can, we can even make it faster because that's only 10 frames a second. So let's do this, get 100 frames a second on the server, it's pretty good. And that's going to be in uh, Unis, Unis to, you know, standard library right there. That gives you micro sleep, which is what students do during my class. There we go, micro sleep, we're going to sleep for uh, 0.01 seconds. So we're going to check the heap, see if anything's ready to blow up. 
see if anything's ready to blow up. If not, we just go back to sleep for a, ten, for a hundredth of a second. And then we wake up again. Once the heap is emptied, then uh, we are done. So, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. Boom. Add an extra zero. Maybe. Let's try that. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. See what's going on. See how debugging. Here we go. Maybe a better way would be to be using a debugger, but a bug debugger with this kind of stuff actually probably is not the um, the best because it break point over and over again. Okay, so, oh wow, no problem. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> so divided by a thousand. All right. Is that right? Let's try that. Okay, here we go. Whoa. Oh. Yeah, okay, I think it's working. I think it worked. So, we creep up on it. Once now exceeds it, the grenade blows up. Interesting. Should be bleeding. It's almost like an alarm. Yeah, it's exactly like an alarm. Is empty, it should break. Why is it it's printing five? Is up so oh that's why yeah 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 okay right 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 okay yep okay so what's happening here is that we delete the top of the heap and then we go and we check what's the time on the top of the heap which is invalid it's undefined behavior so once we've deleted the top of the heap we then need to say you know if heap uh, empty break that's why it was set calling we go. That should do it. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. Boom. Boom. One thousand, two, one thousand. Boom. And we're done. Hot dog. It almost worked right the third or fourth time. <laughs> yeah, you can set an alarm for the future, right? And that's exactly what we're doing here. So you can basically say, hey, uh, at this point in time, I want you to run this function. Do you guys understand? So you can run things in the future. It's pretty cool. And so it's extremely efficient. All you have to do every time the server like updates, it just has to check the top of the heap. It's like, oh, yeah. Are we ready? No, nope. move on. That's it. So um, uh, this is a very efficient and it's it's great. Like a lot of a lot of things in computer science, not just games. Not just games, but a lot of things in computer science, you want to do things in the future. And so doing something like this is just, you can see it's pretty easy to implement. Um, it's not, yeah, you, you can put whatever function you want in here. Like we can maybe do another one, like just to 
show you guys what that looks like. Let's go on, girl. Yeah? Looking for llamas, a seek and find adventure. And Kawaii Doodle Cafe. And I also got some like um some stationery paper. Very nice. So I just added a new grenade function, and so you can see in three seconds, a regular grenade detonates. Then the second one is a flame grenade, and then the third one's a regular grenade. You see how that works? So you can set any time you want and set set a fuse basically, and then you can pass in whichever function you want to have it explode. Cool. So, um, yeah, major events. Yeah, absolutely. You just toss them all into the queue, and then um, you, you know you probably want to you probably want to have an extra check in there, which is like, what if somebody throws a grenade and they like disconnect from the server? You know, so like, there's probably a check you want to make. Like, is my parent still valid by the time I come out? Right? Because those aren't questions you, you you have to ask when everything's synchronous, right? Like when everything's just happening immediately. When you shoot a gun, it's not like the player can disconnect between pulling the pulling the trigger and the hit scan weapon landing. But it is possible for a person to throw a grenade then disconnect, and then if that crashes the server, that's on you. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're the programmer, right? So uh, if you do things like you kill somebody and you try to credit to kill. And that guy is disconnected. You seg fault because it's you use pointers for whatever dumb reason. Um, you shouldn't use pointers because uh, when people go away, the pointers are now like pointing at nothing. So it's much better to have like a user ID or something like that that's unique, and then you can just check to see if that person's disconnected. So the grenade when it goes off, be like, hey, is my parent still valid? No, the guy that threw me's gone. Vanish. So yeah, that's a little little uh, inside baseball on how you can do things like that. And uh, some games service the players pass through disconnection time for a minute or two, sure. Yeah, to, to handle things like that. But like, what if you have? What if you set off a long lasting event? You know, like uh, Fallout seventy six. You like summon a nuclear strike, and then you disconnect, and then a minute later you're gone. Then it hits. You know. So it's it's in general probably a good idea to have like unique user IDs that just monotonically increases. You have a little hash table of like who's currently active and you can check that order one, something like that. It's actually a big problem in uh, in video games that uh, networking networking multiplayer just makes everything more complicated. It makes everything like an order of magnitude more not common more complicated. You know, you got cheating to worry about, you got latency issues, you got synchronization. It's really hard to do a good multiplayer game. But um, anyway, that's it for today, guys. Your quiz for today is gonna be on the array representation of a heap. So if you guys understand that, I'm sure you will do 100% on the quiz. And that is, uh, how do you find out who your left kid is? How do you find out who your right kid is? How do you find out who your parent is? Any questions about that? Nope. All right. All good? All right. Cool. See you guys on Wednesday. Peace.